Hi everybody and welcome to the course. What I'm going to be doing in this video is walking you through the um, assignment for this week. Uh, you should have found the, um, the assignment which is listed simply as assignment for week one. There's about 50 or 60 pages in there that walks you through all the steps in performing a power analysis for a four level study. What I'm going to be doing is going through that same material over here on the video so that you can work through the material using the papers or you can do it by watching the video or probably some combination of the two. Um, my intent over here is to show you uh, both how to use the program and how to think about power analysis and then the exercise for this week is going to be to do a similar power analysis using a separate set of data. So you open up the program, presumably you've been able to download the program and you were able to get an unlock code. If you didn't do that yet, you're going to need to before you can actually use the program, but of course you can still watch the video in the meantime. The program opens up like this, start a new project, you click OK, and the screen looks something like this. There's an interactive guide over here, and when you're using the program on your own, You'll find this is a very useful way to learn the program. You can simply click Next and the program sort of walks you through all the steps and how to use it. It tells you how to set the effect size. It tells you how to set alpha and tails and so on. And in fact, it's pretty much going to walk you through the different parts of the program step by step. You can also jump to any part of this. You see this is divided into parts simply by clicking on that title over here. So for example, if I click on ICC, it jumps to the parts on ICC. If I click on costs, it jumps to the part on costs and so on. We're not going to need this now since uh, I still remember how to use most parts of the program. So I'm going to click X and get rid of that. I can always bring it back by clicking help interactive guide. Um, the screen starts off like this. Initially there are two levels which are called simply levels twos and subjects. Um, one of the things I want to do is to add, well let me go through this in the same sequence that I have it in the um, in the assignment. Um, so the first thing that we want to do is to set the effect size. I click over here the options for effect size, uh, if we're working with means or a standardized mean difference D, where we've standard, standardized by the standard deviation within levels, or the standardized mean difference D, where we've standardized by the standard deviation total. That's the one that we're going to be using. There's another option down here for the odds ratio. We're going to get to that later in the course. So I click on this one, and the effect size is the standardized, the standardized mean difference D, standardized by the total standard deviation. And later on we'll get to the difference between the two versions of D. We'll probably get to that um, next week. The next thing that I want to do is to set the effect size. Now in your materials there should be um, what I've done over here is to give you the parameters for the study. The expected effect size is raw difference of 50 points or a standardized mean difference DT standardized by the total standard deviation of 0.5. So we want to set this to 0.5. You can click on this and as you click it goes up by 0.01 or I can right click over here say that I want to change the D value by 0.1 and then it goes to 0 0.1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So the effect size is now a D value of 0 0.5. The next thing that we want to do is to set the value for alpha and tails. This is currently set alpha is 0.05 at two tail test. I can right click on this. I can set any value that I want for alpha and either a one or a two tail test. We're simply going to leave that as is. The next thing that I want to do is to set the number of levels. I come over here, I click on levels, add a level, levels, add a level. So we have four levels, which are called level fours, threes, twos, and subjects. I can right click on that and I get the option over here for naming these. So we're going to call this one districts. Notice that I use the plural. We're going to call this one schools. Notice that I have trouble spelling. We're going to call this one classes 
and we're going to call this one students and I click OK and we see that those names are now applied the levels are districts schools classes and students now the next thing I can do is name the groups I'm going to click groups edit the group names and by default they're called treated and control I'm simply going to leave them that way but I could have changed them for example to um, high dose low dose or any other uh, names that I wanted to the next thing I have to do is specify which level is going to be randomized. I'm going to work with two versions of this study. In this version, we're randomizing the top level. What you can see over here is that I can right-click on any of these, and it says randomize districts, randomize schools, randomize classes, or randomize students. For the sake of argument, if I was going to click randomize classes, what would happen is districts would then be blocked schools would be blocked and we see that they're blocked because it says that and also because we now have a single bar accounting for both treatment groups whereas classes are randomized we have a separate bar for treated and a separate bar for control and students are nested within classes however as I said for the first version of this we want to randomize districts so I'm going to right click on that click randomize districts and now we have a separate bar for treated and a separate bar for control the next thing that we could do is to set the number of units. So I could come back in here and I could manually change the number of districts or the number of schools and so on. You see, as I click that, it goes from two units per treatment to four or five. But I'm going to, for the time being, I'm going to leave these at the initial value, which is two, 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 and 20. And later I'll show you how to use the program to pick the most cost effective number of units at each level. The next thing that we need to do is to set the ICC or the span of the uh, of the means. Um, I discussed this at some length in the uh, in the materials. In fact, as you probably know, in addition to the materials on the assignment, there is a set of materials called Lesson for Week One, where I explain in some detail what the ICC means and how it's related to the span of means. I'm going to go over that a little bit now, but I suggest that you go back and take a look at those materials as well. The basic idea is that in computing power for any study, we need to know how the, um, how the scores vary in the population because that gives us a basis for figuring out the, the uh, sampling error. Basically, the sampling error is going to be the population variance divided by the number of units. It's going to give us the variance in the sample, which we call the sampling error. If the population variance is large, then we need a relatively large number of units to get a precise estimate. On the other hand, if the population variance is small, then we can get by with a smaller number of units and, it's, and still get a precise estimate. When we're working with a single level study, we only need to be concerned with one population variance, which is the variance, for example, of student scores. But over here, since we're working with a multi-level study, we need to know, first of all, how the student scores are distributed within classes, but then additionally, how the class means are distributed. Are, is it the case that the class means all fall within a very narrow range of each other within a school, in which case we would need only a relatively few number of classes within schools? Or is it the case that the class mean varies substantially from class to class within a school, in which case, once we've selected a school, we'd need a relatively large number of classes within that school? Uh, how do the school means vary? Is it the case that school means tend to be clustered within a narrow range within a district, or do they vary? And finally, how, did, how do the district means vary? Again, the same idea intuitively. If the uh, mean score is pretty much the same from district to district, then we don't need to sample a lot of districts to get an accurate estimate of the mean across districts. Um, we might have only two or three districts assigned to the control group and only two or three districts assigned to the treated group, but that might be enough to give us an accurate estimate of the treated mean and the control mean. By contrast, if the district means vary a lot, then we need to be concerned that if we've sampled only two or three districts for the treated group and only two or three districts for the control group, then those means might be way off the mark. It might be that we've sampled a couple of low districts for one treatment group, and a couple of high districts for the other one, in which case our estimate 
of those two means, and particularly our estimate of the difference is not going to be accurate. So we would need a lot of districts in order to deal with that. There are two ways that we can tell the program how much the district means vary, how much the school means vary, the class means vary, and so on. One of them is to provide a number called the ICC, and the alternate is to actually say how widely the means vary. Uh, traditionally, people in most fields have used the ICC. The ICC is simply, what we say is that given that we have uh, these students over here, and in the example that we're working with, the student scores have a standard deviation of 100 points and a variance of 10,000. That variance can be decomposed into its component parts. A certain amount of that variance. So if the total variance is 10,000, that can be decomposed into the fact that student scores vary within a class and the fact that class means vary within a school the fact that school means vary within a district and the fact that district means vary. And um, what we, we're dealing with with the ICC is the proportion of that total variance that is explained at each level. So for example, working with some data from an education study that was done um, a couple of years ago, the ICC for districts is 0.02, which means that 2% of the total variance takes is attributed to differences between districts. The ICC for schools is 0.05. The ICC for classes is 0.12. And that's really all that you need in order to go ahead and compute, uh, and compute power. You just need the ICCs. However, one issue is that you might be using ICCs and you might like to know how this corresponds to the actual distribution of scores. And you might want to do that for two reasons. The first is to make sure that the numbers that you're using are plausible. In other words, um, the ICC of 0.02 corresponds to a certain dispersion in district means, and you'd like to know what that dispersion is to make sure that it's consistent with your experience. The other thing is that you might be preparing a grant application or a, a study plan, and you're probably you're going to be sharing this with others, and somebody might say, well, what does an ICC of 0.02 represent? And you can say, well, it corresponds to this particular span of means, and then people can have a conversation about whether or not that range is plausible. In order for you to have that option of translating the ICC into um, these uh, spans, well, again, let me repeat, you don't need to do this to compute power, but you do need to do this to get the translation. You come down here, click Options, and you can give it the overall mean for the control group, which is 500. And then this is the part that's critical. We have to give it the span of student scores within classes. Well, in a way that I showed in, in the materials, um, we would expect that the student scores within classes would span about 360 points. And what we mean by that is that within any given class, you would expect the standard deviation of student scores to be about 90. And since we expect approximately 95% of all scores to fall within two standard deviations of the mean, assuming that this is naturally, nor, I'm sorry, that this is normally distributed, the span would be four times the standard deviation of 360 points. So I click OK. And what we see over here is that what we're saying is that the student scores within a class are going to span about 360 points. That's the number that we just put in, which means that in a class where the class mean is uh, 500, we would expect the student scores to range from approximately 320 to 680. And you can see that graphed over here. Here's a mean of 500, and the scores range from here to here. Additionally, given that information, and given the fact that the ICC for classes is 0.12, what this means is that the classes span about 139 points within a school. So in a school where the mean is 500, we would expect the class means to vary from about 430 to 570. Again, that would cover about 95% of all possible classes within a school. The ICC for schools is 0.05, and that means that in a district where the mean is 500, um, we would expect the school means to vary from about 455 to 544. And finally, the ICC for districts is 0.02.
And that translates into um, the idea that if in the state the mean is 500, then the district means would vary from about 471 to 528. Now notice that these spans are fixed. I, I can say that we're expecting the district's mean, the means to, in a district to span about 56 points from the low end to the high end of the 95% um, group. The span for schools is 89, the span for classes is 139, and the span for students is 360. But when I come over here and talk about the actual range, in that case, for districts, well, the range would be um, always 471 to 528 because we know we're asserting that the overall mean is 500. But once I get down to schools, I'm not saying that the range for schools is always going to be 455 to 544. What I'm saying is that it's always going to be an 89 points. So in a district where the mean happened to be 500, we would expect this to be the range. But in a district where the mean happened to be 490, then the range would drop by 10 points. So the schools wouldn't go from 455 to 544. They would go from 445 to 534. So the band stays the same. The range changes. Uh, nevertheless, in the program, we display that around 500 simply as an example. Because what we care about is essentially making sure that these numbers that we're seeing over here are plausible, and hopefully they are. If we look at this and we see that the numbers are not plausible, then we know we need we need to go we know that we need to go back and adjust them. An alternate way of doing this might be in this case I came in and I knew the ICCs and so I simply entered those. Uh, what's going to happen in some cases is that you might not know the ICC. You might come in initially where you're more comfortable knowing that you have a pretty good sense of what the spans are likely to be, and you would simply therefore like to enter the span. What you can do is I'm going to come back over here. I'm going to reset all of these to zero. And I'm going to say, or I click on this and say I want to enter the span of means. And then what I'm going to say is that for districts, the span is approximately 57 points. For schools, the span is approximately 89 points. Obviously, I wouldn't expect to know with this level of precision, but I'm putting in the same numbers over here that we got when we were working with the ICC, just to show you that they'll match. For classes, the span of scores within a school is going to be 139 points. And finally, the span um, of student scores within a class is going to be 360 points. And what you can see over here is that the program has reproduced uh, the same ICCs as we saw before, 0 0.02, 0 0.05, and 0.12. The numbers are uh, rounded. Well, the numbers actually in this case are exact before when we set these numbers up. Um, they were rounded, and that's why the match is not exact. But you can see that it works uh, back and forth. You put in the span, you get the ICC. You put in the ICC, you get the span. I'm going to go back now to the ICC. So we see values of 0 0.02, 0 0.05, and 0.12. And by the way, now that I've switched to the ICCs, since the ICC is what we're entering, what you see is what you get. The decimals that are not being displayed have been, um, have been removed. So the actual value is 0 0.02. If I wanted to use more than two values for the ICC, I could do that. I could simply say use three decimal places or four decimal places and I'd be able to do that. In some cases that turns out to be important, especially when the ICC is very close to zero. In this case, this is as accurate as we uh, need um, to be. The data that were reported were only reported to decimal places. So in any event, that's what we have um, so far. Then we have the, uh, the, the levels, the randomization, the ICC. We don't need to deal with span of effects over here because we're dealing with a fully randomized study, so this doesn't apply. We'll come back to that a little bit later. The next thing we need to deal with is the number of covariates and the R-square. The logic of covariates here is the same 
as it is when we're dealing with a simple randomized trial by including covariates we're able to reduce the error term which of course is going to um, bring up the power and in this case the R square for um, so what we have over here is a co one covariate for districts, two for schools, one for classes, two for students, and the R squares are uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.4, 0.4. So we have 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.4, 0 0.4. Let's just make sure that's right and. It does seem to be right. Let me emphasize one thing. When we're dealing with levels that are randomized or nested as they are over here, the error that we are talking about is error in estimating the mean. And therefore, the point of the R square is to reduce uncertainty in the mean. So the covariate might be, for example, if we're talking about the mean score on the SAT, it might be uh, the school's means, the district mean score on the SAT the previous year, or the student's uh, GPA the previous year. By contrast, when we're talking later about levels which have been uh, blocked or stratified, and we're, in that case, the error we're going to see is going to, to come not from variance in the means, but rather from variance in the effect size. In that case, the R square is going to relate to predictors that are able to predict uh, the, the outcome. In other words, that are, able, that are going to be able to predict the difference between the treated and the control group. I'll come back to that a little bit later. Right now, the goal of the covariance is to predict the mean in each district or the mean in each school. And these are the R squares for that. The next thing we need to deal with is the statistical model. In most cases, this is going to be random, which simply means that the districts have been sampled at random from a population of districts. Within a district, the schools have been sampled at random from a population of schools. Within uh, schools, the classes have been selected at random from a population of classes. And within classes, the students have been selected at random. In some cases, you have the option over here to switch between random and fixed, where fixed means simply that you have included the entire population rather than a sample of it. Uh, in rare cases, that's going to be what we do. Um, for the time being, we're just going to assume that all of these actually are sampled. And when a button does not appear, for example, there's no button up here and there's no button down here, that's because for various theoretical reasons, it is not legitimate to have a fixed sample at that level, and therefore the program does not offer that as an option. The last thing that we want to do is to put in the costs for each level. We need to set the costs. Um, in this example, we're assuming that the cost for each district is $4,000. Um, we can come over here, right-click on this, and say that we want to increment the cost by 100 and knock this up to 4000 The cost for schools is going to be 2000 per school. Again, we right-click, increment it by 100, and go to 2000 The cost for classes is going to be 500 per class. And the cost for students is going to be 100 per student. So what we see initially is that based on these numbers, which are not really meant um, to mean anything except placeholders, the uh, total cost would be $72,000. Power would be, right click on this, say that we want to show power using digits, power would be 12%. One thing that we could do is we could increment the number of classes, and you see as that goes up, power goes up, we can increment the number of schools, and as that goes up, power goes up, we can increment the number of districts. And what we're trying to do is find some combination that's going to give us power 
of let's say 80%. So I've got this set up with 30 students, 12 classes per school, five Okay, 20 schools, so I've got three districts, 20 schools per district, 12 classes per school, 30 students per class. I'm going to get power of 80% at a cost of about $5 million. I picked these numbers somewhat arbitrarily, but the point is that there are virtually an infinite number of combinations of units that will give you power of 80%. What we would like to do is to find the combination of units that gives us power at the lowest possible cost. The first thing we need to do is to come up here and say set the desired power at whatever level we want. In this case, it's 80%. Then we're going to click this thing that says Optimal Design Wizard. And the program opens this up and it says uh, for districts, we want it to find the number that it needs for schools to find the optimal number for classes, the optimal number for students, the optimal number. I click Compute, and um, the program says that the most cost-effective way to do this is going to be to have six districts, two schools per district, three classes per school, and four students per class. And the total cost is going to be not $5 million, but rather $160,000. I click Paste. The program plugs those numbers in here, so I have 6, 2, 3, and 4. I click Close. And now we have power of 81% at a cost of about $160,000. And it's just as easy as that. Uh, we probably could have found these numbers by trial and error, but it would have taken a very, very uh, long time. There's one other thing that's really nice about the program. The first time that I showed this, somebody said, well, that's great, but let's say that I'm working in um, a situation where um, I don't want to use only two schools per district. That logistics are such that once I move into a district, for political reasons, I'd like to be able to have at least four schools within that district. Or what if they say, well, I'm concerned about having only two schools per district, because what if one of them drops out later, I'm going to be left with only one, which is really not enough. So we can come back here, click the Optimal Design Wizard, and we can say that, let's say for the number of schools, rather than using the optimal number, I want to set that number manually, and I want to have at least five, I want to have exactly five schools per district. And I click Compute, and the program comes up with these numbers, 5, 5, 2, and 3, which is going to give me power of 80% at a cost of $220,000. Now this is quite a bit more than 160000 but it's certainly a lot less than $5 million. The key point over here is that when we set one of these numbers manually, the program doesn't simply reset the other numbers to sort of take account of that, but really it reapplies the entire algorithm. And the entire algorithm changes because everything happening over here affects everything below it and in fact affects what's going on on top of it as well. I click Paste, Close, these numbers are put in, and in fact this case I'm going to get power of 85% at a cost of $220,000 and, um, and that's it. The reason that power is 85 rather than uh, something closer to 80 is that once we've set this at 5 there's really no other way to go. If I was to bring down the number of uh, districts to four, power would be less than 85%. If I was going to, I can't bring this down lower than two, or, or it's not going to work with the degrees of freedom that I have, given that I have covariates. If I bring this down, power is going to be less than 80%. So once we've set this at five, the closest approximation that we can get to 80% is going to be 85 but you, the, the basic thing over here is to see that this is working the way that it was intended to. Something else that we can do is we can generate a report by simply clicking on the word report. And the program opens up this executive summary over here. And you should read this in some detail. It's intended not only to sort of document what we've done, but also to explain it so that uh, if there is anything that, that, that the, the program is doing which you hadn't expected, you'll understand that. It gives you a better understanding of how to use um, everything. Uh, so it says over here, it gives all the information about the covariates, the ICCs, and um, so on. 
There's even a nice little disclaimer over here that says this report is intended to help researchers use the program and not to take the place of con consultation with an expert statistician, uh, which in fact is true. I mean, I've, my experience as a statistician has been uh, that it's pretty easy to answer the questions that people ask, but that people generally don't know what questions to ask. And uh, a power analysis on its own is, is not necessarily helpful if the people planning the study have missed some other uh, critically important points that might affect the validity of the study. So simply having a program to use is not enough. The purpose of this program is to take these things which are extremely difficult or impossible to do by hand and give you a mechanism for, for um, working with them. We'll cover some of this in more detail uh, next week. Uh, I should point out that you can take this, you can print the whole thing, um, you can actually print it, uh, let's see, view, funds, edit, you can copy one page at a time to the clipboard, you can save the whole thing as an RTF file and bring it into a Word document or some other um, program later. I'm going to close the report and come back here. Uh, let me give you a quick heads up on a couple of other things we can do. We can create a graph so that over here, for example, um, basically all of these uh, parameters are taken from the main screen. We have a four-level cluster design, districts are randomized, and so on. And we see over here that for the number of districts per condition, we get power of 85.4% with five districts, which is exactly the same thing we saw on the other screen a minute ago. But something you can now do is you can say, well, if I went to six districts, how would power be affected, or to seven? And you can you can see over here, this is sort of the sweet spot in the in the curve that, you know, you don't want to probably go below this, but that once you get past here, there's really very little increase in precision or increase in power for additional number of districts. So you might want to go to six or seven districts get power up to 96 percent but once you pass that point you're not really getting a lot of bang for the buck you can actually move this thing along by just dragging it you can also use these buttons over here to move that back and forth it'll jump from one to the next and as it does these numbers over here change something else that you can do is you might want to add more than one line inside the graph i can come over here I can say I want to add a series within the graph. Let's say I want to have more than one value for the number of, um, let's say for the ICC, for districts. We've assumed that ICC is 0 0.02, but what if it's actually 0.05? I'm going to click OK. And you can see over here you get one graph based on an ICC of 0 0.02, and this is for an ICC of 0 0.05. So what we can see is that if we're powering for this and the ICC is actually 0 0.02, we're going to get power of 85%. But if the ICC is actually 0 0.05, power is going to be as low as 68%. We can come over here and we see that, okay, if we go to six districts, then if the ICC is 0 0.02, which we're assuming the power is over 90, but if in fact we've made a mistake and power is only, I'm sorry, the ICC is actually 0 0.05, we're still going to get decent power. And again, you can sort of move this um, this little uh, button over here, right or left, and you can also move it up or down. And as you click on any particular point, this box over here is going to give you more information for that point. There's also an interactive guide for this screen, just as there was for the other one, that walks you through all the steps in using it. Again, we're going to close this out and come back here. Okay, that's basically the way we would work this if we were talking about a study that was randomized at the top level. Let's come back and see what happens if we randomized classes. And just for a moment, let's go back over here to the Optimal Design Wizard. Let's use the optimal number for everything. Click Compute, Close, and let's save this entire... I'm sorry, I forgot to paste that. Compute, Paste, close. So we have the scenario over here that's going to cost us $160,000. I'm going to click on Scenarios, Show the Scenarios, Add this scenario. So we've got power of 0.81 at a cost of $160,000. What if we block the top two levels? What if I click over here and say I want to randomize, instead of randomizing districts or schools, I'm going to randomize classes. What happens now is that this level is blocked and this level 
is blocked. So what's happening is that at these levels, we no longer need to be concerned about the fact that the mean varies from one unit to the next, because once we pick a district, that district is going to have in it both the treated and the control conditions. Therefore, if the mean, what we're really looking at is the difference between treated and control within districts, it doesn't matter if that happens to be a district with a low mean or a high mean, because that difference washes out. It's only the difference between the treated and the control that matters. However, there is a new source of error we need to be concerned with which is how much does the treatment effect vary from one district to the next. And we're going to have to enter that information over here. First, let's come over here and enter the cost for districts. Let's say, again, that it's $4,000, the same number that we were using before. And we need to enter a cost for um, schools. Let's make it 2000 the same as it was before. And we have to talk about what is the span of effects. How much does the effect vary? from one district to the next. Well, the mean effect we said was 0.5. And let's assume that the effect varies from maybe 0.35 to point, um, 0.65. So that would be a span of 0.30. And we see over here that means that it goes from 35 to 65. And let's assume that within a district that happens to have a mean effect of 0.5, the effect varies between schools, let's say between by a span of 40 points, which means that it goes from 0.30 to 0.70. You can see that graphed over here. Here's the overall um, mean effect. The mean effect of zero would be no effect. The mean that we have is 0.50, which is right over here. And for districts, it varies across this range. For schools, it varies across this range. Um, now we can come back, use the optimal design wizard, say find the uh, most cost effective design, paste it in, and we're going to get power of 84% at a cost of $76,000. This is substantially less than the cost that we had before. The best cost was $160,000. And the reason for that is what often happens when we're able to block designs. We are taking this relatively large source of error, which was the, um, the variance in means from this from district to district, the variance of means from and mean from school to school within a district, and replacing it with a relatively small source of error, which is the fact that the effect size varies from one district to the next or from one school to the next. In many cases, we don't expect that much variance in the effect size, so that error is smaller. And what we can see now is that with this design, we're able to get a much more cost-effective study. We're going to open up the scenarios, show them. We're going to add this one. And now let's label these two. Let's call this one. We're going to edit that name. And we're going to call that uh, randomize districts. And we're going to edit this one and call it randomize schools. And the nice thing about this is now if you obviously might want to set up any number of these, you can also have one obviously you've randomized. Um, I'm sorry, this was actually randomized classes. Let me go back and edit that, randomize classes. You might want to have another one where you've randomized schools or where you've randomized students or where other things are different. Maybe where we're using different numbers for the costs or for the ICCs. The point is you can save all of these in advance, bring them to a meeting, and then discuss them. And you don't want to have to re-enter the information each time. I can simply click on Randomized Districts, click Restore, and that entire scenario is brought back over here. You can see that these now have a separate bar for each treatment. The cost is now back to 160000 I can come back to this one, click Restore, and that scenario is back. And then when I go ahead and save the file um, and call this week one and save it, and I'm going to X out of here, the next time I come back and use the program, I'm simply using this in development mode, so mine looks a little bit different than yours. But the next time I come back to the program, I can say open an existing file. It's going to open up. Here's a list of my recent files. I can open up this one. I can click. It's going to automatically open up with whatever I had been using the last time. But if I go to scenarios, 
show scenarios. The other scenario is there as well. I can restore it and work with it again. So this is a, a very uh, basic introduction to the program. I have not shown you all of the features yet, but probably enough to keep you busy for the first week. In the assignment, what you need to do now is to use this program to uh, compute power for the uh, two studies that are listed at the end of the assignment. They are similar idea to the one that we've been using over here, but they involve only two levels because I wanted to keep this a little bit um, easy for the first week. And uh, I suggest that you get started on it whenever it's convenient, and please obviously post your questions as they come up. As I mentioned in the materials, um, or I think I did, I've completely revamped the materials for this year. Um, I did that because I, I've learned more about this since I taught the course last year, and um, I wanted to present you with the most current version of uh, my thinking on this. So as you go through it, you might find some mistakes. I apologize for that, but please let me know, and I will do my best to respond very quickly. This will also obviously allow me the opportunity to correct the uh, any mistakes that there might be, which will help you and also help me get the, uh, the manual into um, better shape. Uh, please feel free to send me feedback if you think I'm covering this material too quickly or too slowly. Um, please let me know. Um, what I generally try to do is to make sure that I keep everybody um, up to speed, but that if people want uh, additional exercises or uh, more advanced information, I'm happy to provide that um, while not requiring everybody to uh, look at it. So, for example, we have materials on the formulas that were used for this and so on. If people want to have a look at that, please um, let me know. I look forward to um, four weeks with you. Um, this is Michael Borenstein, and uh, good evening. I just noticed that the numbers that I came up with in this example uh, don't quite match the numbers that I had in the PDF, and the reason for that was a small mistake on my part, I hope. I come back to save scenarios, and I open up the one where we randomize classes and restore it. We had come up with before with a cost of 76,000. The reason is that I had set the R square for schools at point 10, it should have been point 20. And if I set it at point 20, and now by the way, I can resave this, I'm going to add that and then get rid of this one and call this one randomized classes. And then we go back over here to the optimal design wizard and click compute and paste and close. And in fact, we get power of 80% at a cost of 71,200, which is exactly what we had in the materials. I apologize for the, uh, the mistake on my part. Okay, bye-bye.